Today we're going to talk to you about the 655 engine in our 655 Brome. The 655 engine by Kissel was the third in a line from 638, 645, and 655. They're each end block engines started in late 1916 by Kissel with the 638. Each of the engines becomes a little bit more advanced but shares a lot of the features from one to the other. What we have here is engine number 55-12250. The reason that's important, located on the plate on the side of the engine here, is 55-12249 is actually the car number for this car. So this is a matching numbers car. Now anybody could just change that particular tag on the driver's side of the engine, but there's another way to tell that the engine is real. The oil pan down on the bottom of a 655 engine at this time is a cast aluminum oil pan. If we were to pull it off, you'd actually notice that when we looked at the crankshaft flange that the number 55-12250 is stamped in the crankshaft flange, telling you that in fact it is that particular engine. So we have a matching numbers engine. You now know, look on the crankshaft flange for a 55 engine by Kissel and you'll find the actual engine number stamped in the crankshaft. Next thing to know about a Kissel 655 engine at this time and Kissel engines in the 1920s, at least mid to late, is they have an oil gauge located down behind the steering box here. So we'll let Miss Trish swing around and let you see that particular oil gauge. <laughs> nice thing about the oil gauge is it's a lot better than a dipstick. It's an accurate indication of exactly what's in that oil pan. It works simply on a float system and they're very rare. You seem to find them pretty much on Kissels. I don't know if anybody else ever used one. Besides the oil gauge, on this side of the engine we have something that's important that cannot be seen readily. In a little bit we'll do a little drawing to explain about it, but I'm going to show you by pointing to it where it is. Down below the horn, between the exhaust pipe and the bridge motor mount, right under the bridge motor mount, is where your oil pressure adjustment is for the engine. That oil pressure adjustment has a huge amount of adjustment available. We have found out that you could set it as high as 90 to 100 pounds. Obviously that's not correct. Kissel says roughly 30 pounds for 30 miles per hour. What you do not want to do is exceed what the gauge capacity is. The gauge goes up to 50 pounds. So the idea with this engine is to be sure to set it so that when you have your maximum de depress on your accelerator pedal, you cannot exceed 50 pounds. And we did that using a modern oil gauge and then hooked it up to its actual oil gauge from the 1920s. So it's developing sufficient pressure but will not exceed 50 pounds. Looking at the top of the engine here, one of the things that's interesting that shows the progression from the 638 through to the 655 is the spark plugs in use are still 7 8 spark plugs. So Kissel carried that particular size spark plugs through on the 638, 645, and 655 engines normally. One of the things that changed, particularly with 655 engines over time, is the position of the exhaust pipe. In this case, it's coming up around the front of the engine and down the driver's side. The exhaust pipe on earlier 655s stays on the passenger side. Other things to note here, we have an oil filter system. This is a vacuum oil filter system. So if somebody were to disconnect one of the lines from the vacuum oil filter system and think, oh, I'm going to find out what the oil pressure in the engine is this way. No, you cannot. It has absolutely nothing to do with the oil pressure system whatsoever. This particular line here is bringing your vacuum in to suck oil from this line right here, coming from the passenger side of the car. That goes into your filter and the filtered oil goes out through the loop and down into the driver's side of that oil pan. Again, it has nothing to do with the oil pressure system. You cannot check oil pressure on those particular lines. Now we're going to swing around and look at the passenger side of the engine and talk about another series of features that this particular engine has. 
All right, looking at the front of the engine here, you'll see Kissel still uses a flat leather belt. That's exactly what was done in 1926 on this engine. And as I noted, we have the exhaust going forward and around towards the driver's side of the engine. Earlier 655s have the exhaust going directly to the rear. It does not pass around the front. Up here in your timing cover, something we cannot show you because it's internal, is the fact that the timing system has a hydraulic chain tightener on it. This is a feature that Kissel has on late 55s for sure. I cannot tell you when they first started using hydraulic chain tighteners, but this engine is equipped with one from the factory. Directly below the belt, in line with the camshaft, something that cannot be shown to you exactly, but in line with the camshaft here, below the fan belt is a adjustment for the end of the cam. The particular cam adjustment that we're talking about here is very important because that particular cam adjustment is a bolt with a lock nut on it. It is necessary to have the bolt running against the end of the cam in order to maintain the camshaft in the proper position to keep it in mesh with the oil pump. So it is very important not to change this setting without pre-measuring it. If it is not kept in line properly by keeping the camshaft far enough back, obviously you'll lose oil pressure, but you'll also have something else happen before losing oil pressure, and that is the cam will walk just a little bit and the engine will make some pretty nasty noises. It isn't destroying anything, but it definitely doesn't sound good. So that particular cam adjustment should not be changed unless you're doing major service on the engine where you're actually taking it apart and redoing it, or you find that you are starting to get a little noise, then you might have to change it. Normally, there should not be any need to change that. Coming along the side of the engine here, something that's really important is this 655 engine is one of the latest 655 engines Kissel made. That means that this shaft, the accessory shaft coming out of your timing cover here, is spinning at a very odd rate. It's spinning at two and one-third times the crankshaft speed. It's a very strange speed being used, but obviously, for whatever reason, they needed to spin it that fast. Guess maybe they're trying to pump more water with the water pump. Not sure if that's it but they did change the ratio so that it's running at two and a third times the engine speed. But you can't have that when you're done. You actually have to be two times the engine speed so that you stay in time between your distributor and your crankshaft so that you're firing everything at the right time. Now, one of the problems that Kissel gave us is that 655 engines in particular utilize generators that seem to only be used on Kissel engines. You can't find an interchange for them. This particular car did have its original generator removed by a previous owner. This left us without one to drive the distributor. We have found a generator that we could ad adapt to this car. It's actually, believe it or not, a tractor generator from the 1930s that we took and machined the front so it's very similar to the original generator, very similar in placement, appearance. If I hadn't told you in a way you wouldn't know, except there's a very important thing that's been done here. Directly behind the carburetor and not visible, as you look at it, it's basically not visible. We have built a custom gearbox, which changes the two and a third rotation of this accessory shaft to the exact two to one rotation we need. So we actually have an auxiliary gearbox that we've hidden behind the carburetor that is got two drain plugs in it, or in other words, a fill plug and a drain plug, and has modern seals in it, which allows it to run without any problem, filled with oil for years, and it will operate nicely and allow you to drive the generator and the distributor in time, and the engine runs beautiful utilizing this system. And if I hadn't told you about it, you would probably never realize that's been done. Now also, because we're using a different generator distributor combination, we have made another improvement. That particular distributor has its own centrifugal advance. It is absolutely not necessary on this particular 655 equipped car to use the hand advance lever on the steering column. In fact, you should never touch it 
because that would actually be reversed from what you want because of how that is um, set up as a distributor. We left it all there, all the linkage is there, but you do not need to use it. This car does not need to use a hand advance on its spark. So don't ever bother with it. It'll do everything for you in that case. Other thing you should know about here, the carburetor that is on this particular 655 engine and a number of them at this time is a very unique and sort of odd system. It utilizes only one adjustment that you can actually make, which is this particular knob right here that's a knurled knob. That particular knurled knob adjusts both your idle and your normal running mixtures. Do not reset this unless you absolutely have to. If you do, we strongly recommend you mark it temporarily with a Sharpie in case you mess it up. Because it is a very difficult carburetor we found to get adjusted out just right. It technically doesn't have a traditional choke, although you'll find that we do have a choke wire here. It's more of an air limitation done by a fulcrum and a ramp than a standard choke. So it limits the movement of the air intake and doesn't really act like a choke like you're used to, although it produces somewhat the same result. This particular spot right here on top of the carburetor, you can unscrew this large screwdriver and this is the ability to find out where your float is when the carburetor is actually closed. Should you decide to turn off the fuel with the little valve we stuck below the vacuum tank, you may find that your carburetor dries out. And in order to refill it, because you have a limited amount of head pressure initially, you actually have to undo this, lift up on the valve, it'll fill up, and from then on, it'll be just fine. But the initial one is totally dry, it doesn't like to fill on its own if it's totally dried out. Your line here is your incoming gas line running back up over to the other side where you can see your vacuum fuel tank, the vacuum fuel tank being the black tank. The particular glass bowl, that shows you the fuel coming in from the tank on the back of the car goes into the vacuum tank and fills up. And as I said, at the bottom of the vacuum tank, if Trish swings the camera right, you can see that there is a valve we've added that you can shut off in case you want to leave the car for a prolonged time. You can shut off your fuel right there. And that gives you a little idea of how you can keep the car safe when you're in storage. You have the correct centrifugal air cleaner here. You'll find at idle, your centrifugal air cleaner will not spin much at all. However, as you rev up the engine, the centrifugal air cleaner spins quite fast and actually makes sort of a whirring sound, not all that different from early superchargers. And it makes for the car to have a kind of interesting, different sound. Water pumps on these engines are the old fashioned rope packing water pumps using original water pump grease that we've used. Something you should know about setting the valves underneath here, which is not visible because Kissel put a pipe in front of it, is the valve setting, which is suggested on a plate at 8 thousandths hot. Now I defy somebody to tell me how they're going to set them at 8 thousandths hot when you've got a tube in front of them and you'd have to pull the tube, which means removing the floorboards to get to it. So don't set them at 8 thousandths hot. We've set them all at 12 thousandths cold and the engine sounds just fine and works beautifully. So 12 thousandths cold is a better way to set it. Now something we should tell you about the various interesting problems this engine gave us. Not knowing where to set that bolt on the end of the camshaft gave us a great deal of difficulty finally getting the oil pressure up in the engine. That took us quite a bit of time to figure out how to get it set right because Kissel doesn't give us any instructions on how to do it. So we had to do it by the by guess and by gosh method and it took quite a bit of playing around to finally get that correct. And when I show you how to adjust the oil pressure, that's the other portion of getting the oil pressure right in the car. On the top of the engine here, which of course you can't see, this is an end block engine, six cylinder, and it is a L head style engine, meaning the valves are going to be on the passenger side and the pistons are on the driver's side. What we found, which really surprised us, is some previous owner had either themselves or had somebody do a valve job on the car. 
and we found that, hey, we need to do a, a little valve lapping. At that time, we weren't aware that what had been done, though, is that the person who had done this valve job on the block had screwed it up very badly. It was non-concentric. They either had an incorrect guide they were using or a bent guide, resulting in the fact we couldn't generate proper cylinder compression with the valve job that had been done on it. So we ended up having to have a new valve job done on it. All the valves were done, all the valve seats were done, and the result is, is we got 50 pounds compression all the way across the engine beautifully. The other thing that we had to do with this engine is we re-ringed it because the rings seemed to be weak and we seemed to have too much blow-by. That's also been done. But the interesting things to note, the engine appears to be as low mileage as we've been led to believe it is. The reason it appears that way, it's got its original cylinders at the original bore with almost no wear in them. They do not look like they've been sleeved. The valves, on the other hand, there were two seats that we found that had been done. So somehow, somebody kind of messed up that portion of the engine, but it has now been completely fixed, so everything works beautifully. Now, what we're going to do is give you a little information, show you in a drawing how the pressure for the oil is set. And so we'll switch to a little paper and give you a little drawing of that. If we were looking side on. So we're looking at the side of this particular adjuster. Looks about like this, where it will have the bolt. This is the bolt. This is your lock nut. This is your base. And this base is threaded, and this would be your engine block. So this is the engine here. That's what it looks like when the cover's off of it. The cover looks about like this, and it also has what looks like a nut. The cover just goes on and screws on here, okay? So this is the exterior. You would take the cover off, then you loosen the nut, then you can screw this bolt in or out. That bolt inside is actually a little special because inside the bolt you have a hollow area. So this is the inside of the bolt, it's hollow, and there's a spring in that bolt. So what you're really doing is adjusting tension on this spring, which acts against a ball, which goes in a seat. So by changing the pressure of the spring on that ball in the seat, it tells you how much oil can go by it and go into the engine. So if you make this too tight, you can get 90 to 100 PSI, which is way too much. You should have a max of 30 PSI at 30 MPH cold. Kissel says 20 to 23 PSI hot. Your gauge has 50 PSI maximum. So whatever you set, which it is always set for you, you do not want to exceed 50 PSI maximum. That would be with the accelerator all the way to the floor and the engine spinning as fast as it could momentarily to see what your maximum PSI is. So maximum PSI should never exceed that number. And this I consider more important than these two numbers because if you're going to exceed this, you'll destroy the gauge and you won't know what your oil pressure is. So that gives you a little idea of what goes on with the oil pressure system regulation in the 655 engine. Last thing we want to tell you about, when we're on the other side, the driver's side, that's where the starter is located in the car. Even though the starter on this car is rebuilt, even though it's running double watt cables, even though we have got good connections everywhere, the engine doesn't like to turn real well on a six for a start. So this particular car is equipped with a 612 system. It runs everything on six, but we have a little switch that we'll show you in another video that you flip when you start in the car and it'll spin the car over real fast and start it really nice. We find this is the best solution. As I said, even with a rebuilt starter and all the connections new and good with double out cables, it just spins too slow to start the car nicely. So that was our solution to that. One other thing you should know, this is a thermostat housing here that Kissel put in. 
The thermostats that we've looked everywhere don't seem to fit. You could probably cobble one to go in there. We are finding that the thermostat is not really proving to be necessary. Everything is working fine without it. But just like most old cars, they don't want to sit forever and do nothing. They actually do want to go. As you notice, Kissel gives you no fan shroud at all. And so sitting permanently in Arizona and not moving, yeah, eventually it won't like that. So the car is meant to be driven and not sit and just run ad nauseum in one place. But it works quite beautifully without the thermostat. But we thought maybe you should know that technically a thermostat goes in there reading the temperature with an infrared reader. We come up with temperatures between 160 and 180 being normal. That should give you some information about a Kissel 655 engine so that you understand what is here, uh, what is going on, and a couple special features about the engine so you could identify it as being real, and particularly how we have driven the distributor system and corrected for the fact that you have a two and a third times turn on the shaft and we needed to get it down to two to properly time everything together.